Let me encourage you to open your Bibles to two passages in the New Testament. We'll also uh, later on look at a passage from Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. Ephesians chapter 6 and John chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 6 and John chapter 1. In Ephesians 6, uh, well, on Wednesday nights we've been working our way through the book of Colossians. And Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapters 5 and 6 are, are very similar. There are five passages in the letters of the New Testament that we call household codes. Um, uh, Martin Luther called them table talk. And, and uh, uh, they describe how Christianity is to operate in the home. How Christians are to live out their faith in, in their family relationships. Husbands and wives, children and parents, and servants and masters. And the reason servants and masters are in there is because servants lived in the home. Don't, don't picture them as, as slaves working out in cotton fields in the Old South. That wasn't it at all. They, they were in the home and doing household chores and helping to educate and to, to rear the children. You find these household codes in Jewish literature, Roman literature, Greek literature... But in the Christian literature, they're completely different. The other literature outlined the responsibility of wives to their husbands, but never husbands to the wife. He had no obligation. It outlines responsibility of children to their parents, but never the parents to the children. It outlines the obligation of servants to their master, but never master to their servant. And when Paul and Simon Peter wrote these and put them in the hands of the church of that first century, it was revolutionary. It was completely uh, topsy-turvy. It was mutual obligations of wife and husband and husband and wife. Mutual obligation, children to parents, parents to children. Mutual obligation of the slave to the master and master to the slave or to the servant. And the reason these are in the New Testament, is because the church, well, there were no church buildings until the third century. Christianity was 250 years old before we find anything like this. And they weren't like this. They were much smaller, of course. The church met in the home. And for Christianity to be, to be real, for it to have a, a witness and an impact in their community and in their culture, it had to be real in the home. That's where the church met. And so we find in the last part of Ephesians 5 and the first part of Ephesians 6, one of the five household codes in the New Testament. So let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. This is kind of what you would expect to hear, these first three verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. This is the part that had never been heard before. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. John is writing about Jesus and says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or did not overpower it. May God add His richest blessings to the reading of His Word, and may His Holy Spirit apply the preaching and the teaching of His Word to your heart and to mine this day. Please be seated. I am uh, I'm 64 years old. So if you're my age, a little younger, a little older, maybe you remember that when we were growing up, there was a television program that came on Sunday mornings, about the time we were getting ready for church. It was sponsored by the Christophers. I don't remember who the Christophers were, and I don't remember much about the program except the ending to it. It always ended with just this black screen and a single unlit candle in the middle of the screen. A hand would come into the screen to light the candle, and then a voice would say, it is better to light one little candle than to curse the darkness. Some of you watched it. Better to light one solitary candle than to curse the darkness. You know, there's a lot of darkness in our world today. 
And it seems to be getting closer and closer and more intense all the while. But we have a choice. You and I have a choice. We can either curse the darkness and cower in fear and despair as it threatens to engulf us, or we can choose to bring light, the light of Christ, into the darkness. And that darkness cannot overpower His light. That's the option I prefer. I think that's the option our church would choose. And that's what I want to preach about this morning. This sermon is intended to help light some candles of hope insofar as our children and our young people are concerned. You know, when Jesus had truth that He wanted to communicate to the people of His day, He often told stories. We call them parables. We preached one of those parables last Sunday, the parable of the unjust or the the unjust steward, the unjust tenants. Um, He would tell the story and then He would... Share lessons from it. Sometimes he he just let the story sit there and the people had to garner the understanding, their lessons from it. So this morning, I want to try to do that. Here's the story. It's about a teenage girl. We'll, We'll call her Cassie. And her parents are named Brad and Misty. Cassie had always been a beautiful, happy child. Always smiling and Loved to be with other children, but things began to change when she hit the ninth grade. Her mother recalls that she just had this gut feeling that something wasn't right in their daughter's life. She never could pinpoint it. She just knew intuitively that she and Brad had lost touch with Cassie. Misty searched Cassie's room one day and found hidden letters from one of her daughter's closest friends. Letters that left her speechless. The letters described things that the girls could do to their parents that would be tragic. Misty also learned that Cassie was developing an interest in witchcraft, suicide, alcohol, and drugs. Facing the trauma of how to deal with a troubled teenager, the parents decided that the only way to stop their daughter from making more bad decisions was to begin to make some good decisions for her. They changed Cassie's school. They regularly searched her room and her backpacks. They forced her to cut off all contact with everyone she hung out with, including her best friend. Brad said it's the hardest thing a parent will ever do, to put your foot down and say, it stops here. And it was hard for a long time for that father and mother. They had to endure all those days and nights of telling of their daughter telling them how much she hated them. But, her mother said, we knew what we felt was best for her and what we felt we had to do. One weekend, Brad and Misty allowed their daughter Cassie to go on a youth retreat with the church's youth group. That retreat changed their daughter's life forever. When she left, they recall she was this gloomy, head-down, say-nothing girl. When she came back, her eyes were open and bright. She was bouncy and was excited about what had happened to her. She could hardly wait to tell her mother and father all about it. It it was like she'd been in a dark room and somebody turned on the light. All of a sudden she realized, there's beauty all around me. Her mother said, Cassie looked at me in the eye and she said, Mom, I've changed. I've totally changed. I know you're not going to believe it, but I'll prove it to you. And she did. Easter that year was on April the 4th. Two weeks later, on Sunday, April the 18th, Cassie was featured in a video that was shown to her church's youth group. In it, she gave her testimony. Cassie said, you really can't live without Jesus Christ. It's like impossible to really have a true life without Him. Two days later, Tuesday, April 20th, 1999, at precisely 11.19 a.m., Cassie Bernal was studying in the library at Columbine High School when two gunmen, two of her classmates, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, burst into the, to the room. According to her mother's subsequent book entitled, She Said Yes, And according to multiple accounts given by eyewitnesses, Cassie was asked by one of the gunmen as he pointed the gun at her head, Do you believe in God? Without hesitating, she said, 
Yes. He then asked rhetorically, why? But before she could give an answer, he pulled the trigger. Cassie Bernal's witness for Christ went global. Major news sources, including radio, television, print, even NPR, called her a modern-day martyr. The Boston Globe reported that, quote, accounts of the final moments of Cassie's life echoed with the history of early Christians when a profession of faith could be a fatal act. You can't really live without Jesus Christ, she had said. It's like impossible to have a true life without Him. Cassie, as she had vowed to her parents, really had changed. After her death, Cassie's parents, Brad and Misty Bernal, took great hope and found great courage and confidence in that change and in Jesus, the one who they say was responsible for bringing that change about. Now, that's my story this morning, and I find it still as powerful today as it was 19 years ago, our first April in Abilene, when we were living at 801 South Pioneer Drive, just across the street, watching that story unfold on CNN, as many of you were. I'd say that Brad and Misty did right by their daughter, Cassie. And as a parent, I tried to draw from their experience some lessons that I could use as a parent and some lessons that I'd like to try to pass on this morning. I know I'm not drawing these lessons directly from the text as I normally would on a Sunday morning preaching assignment. But I believe that when parents are walking daily with Jesus Christ, when we're allowing the Spirit of Christ to fill us and to control and direct us, these truths are related directly to the Word of God. Taking notes, you might want to write this down. Notice, first of all, Brad and Misty, Cassie's parents, trusted their instincts, their God-given intuition. Remember, they said they, they just had this gut feeling that something wasn't right. And at first, they couldn't pinpoint it, but they just knew intuitively, instinctively, something was wrong. I imagine that Brad and Misty had some conversations with their daughter, much like the conversations we've had with our children Over the years, you know, Cassie, what's going on? Who are these friends you're always hanging around with? Are you out drinking with them? Are any of them doing drugs or trying to get you to? What do you guys do when you're out so late? Where do you go? Why do you keep your door shut all the time? And I imagine that Cassie probably responded like some of our children have responded. What's the big deal? Don't you trust me? Why don't you like my friends? You're always running them down. You don't know them. You don't know anything about them. Why are you always hassling me? Why can't you just leave me alone? Now, I know that none of us who are parents want to believe that our child is doing something wrong. That our child could possibly be doing something that would be harmful to them or to others. The only folks who have the luxury of thinking that your child is perfect is their grandparents. Parents have to be willing to be more honest than that. We parents never have to teach our children how to misbehave. That's part of the fallen human condition. It comes naturally. When when Claudia's dad owned the Han Family Pharmacy in Denver, Colorado, near downtown on Koufax Street, he said he noticed that little children, I mean barely walking, would walk over to the candy shelf and look around to see if anybody was looking and and would take one. And nobody had ever taught that child that was wrong. That child just knew that was wrong. It's not a bad reflection on you or your family when you face up to and try to assist your child with their problems. If they're having problems and they're struggling, it's okay to admit it. What is tragic is when you know something is wrong and you do nothing about it. When you know that your child is in trouble and you try to ignore it. As followers of Jesus Christ, when you seek God's will and you're earnestly praying for His wisdom, you can trust those gut feelings. Those gut feelings are put there by God. You can't operate simply on what you want to believe. 
You can't keep on denying what you're afraid might be true. And you can't get away from your responsibility simply because you'd rather not know the truth. Cassie's parents were obviously godly praying parents. Their desires for their child matched God's desires for her. Their hearts beat with God's heart as a parent caring for their child. And thus, they trusted those God-given instincts. They trusted those God-given gut feelings, if you will. Second, they did the hard thing. They stood up for what they believed. They stood up for what was right. Remember in their story, they finally put their foot down and said, it stops here. Enough is enough. And that was the hardest thing they said they ever had to do. Why? Well, it's because they meant it. And since they meant it, they had to follow up their words with some very hard and painful actions. They changed Cassie's school. They routinely searched her room and some of her belongings. They forced her to cut off contact with the gang that she'd been running with including her best friend. But keep this in perspective. They didn't do this out of anger or as punishment. They resorted to this because they were trying to save their child. They were seeking to rescue their daughter. Hear me. Parents, you have that prerogative as parents. It comes with the territory. It's part of the responsibility and obligation you have as a mom and dad. You must know what's going on in the life of your child. And you have to be willing to stand up for, for, for what's right. That means you, you can't just excuse unacceptable behavior as being, all oh, that's just a phase that they're going through. It also means that you batten down the hatches and do whatever you may be forced to do to weather the inevitable storms that will come when you start putting reasonable boundaries around your child's behavior and around the friends that they're hanging with. It also means that if your child is one of those children, and and, and I hate to bring this up, but if your child is one of those kids that other parents say to their children, stay away from him or her, you need to find out what that's about. That doesn't usually happen for no reason at all. And before you call those other parents and unload on them, And read them the riot act and and, and lash out in anger. You better be satisfied that you know what your child has been up to. I had five older sisters. They were all teenagers in Southern California in the late 60s. And just for the record, that was the 1960s, not the 1860s. I've had two sons. I've coached hundreds of Little League baseball, flag football, basketball, and soccer games. I invested my life as a youth minister, as a college minister. I could tell you stories that would make the hair on your toes curl. I was a recreation minister. I know what I'm talking about. In fact, just having five older sisters, teenagers in California in the 60s, makes me virtually an expert on all this. <laughs> Talking about discipline and punishment, and they're not the same. Discipline is setting limits. It's establishing boundaries. It's defining acceptable behavior and unacceptable behavior. It's defining what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. It's making certain that your children know what the boundaries are and that they live within those boundaries. Discipline is training in self-control. It's instruction in self-denial and learning to say no as a child. It's like the Bernal said, if your child starts making really bad decisions, you have to be willing to step in and make good ones for them. That's part of what it means to be a parent. Punishment, on the other hand, is corrective action. It's demonstrating that there are consequences for poor choices and bad behavior and selfish living. When our children challenge us and defy us and push everything to the limits or defiantly break the rules, corrective punishment is what's called for. And that's the hardest thing we do as parents. When we discipline our children and then we see them start to cry or we see them get really angry, or we, we, we see the disappointment in them, we can experience guilt as parents and, and regret because we've made our child unhappy. And that's where we're tempted to back off 
and relent and not carry through with the punishment. And the moment we do that, we have just relinquished control to a 13-year-old or a 15-year-old. The child discovers that the next time they break the rules and get caught, all they have to do is play on mom's and dad's emotions, and they're going to get a break. James Dobson used to liken children to night watchmen at a large department store, factory, or warehouse. The night watchman goes around at nighttime with his flashlight, and he, 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 he tests all the locks on all the doors. Now, he wants them to be locked. He wants them to hold. But he's going to test them. He not only wants them to hold, he really, for his own safety, he needs them to hold. But he will test them. That's his job. Dobson says, children are like that. Teenagers are like that. They're going to jiggle every lock. They're going to test every rule. They're going to test every boundary that their parents or their youth minister or their coach or their principal lays down for them. They're going to test them. But listen to me. They need those locks to hold. They need you to be firm and remain firm in holding the line when right and wrong is involved, when acceptable and unacceptable is involved. And deep down, whether they ever voice it or not, they want you to hold. Because when a parent holds firm to a reasonable rule or boundary, what they're saying to their child is, I love you. What they're saying is, I want only what is best for you. When I lived in Dorita, Louisiana, before we moved here, one of my fellow pastors in the community was named Brother Raymond Willie. Raymond had a, a beautiful daughter, and her best friend was the daughter of one of the wealthiest couples in the whole parish, Louisiana's parishes, not counties. One, this, this, uh, this friend, uh, her parents gave no boundaries for her. She had never had a curfew, could stay out as long as she wanted, could buy whatever she wanted to buy. Uh, they, they, uh, they gave her everything and never questioned anything. And one night, she was over at the Willie's house, and Raymond's daughter and her friend said, uh, Daddy, there's a party at so-and-so's house. Can we go to that party? Now, Raymond knew there was no supervision, no adult supervision at that party. So he said to his daughter, Sweetheart, I'm sorry, but I, I can't let you go. And she did the typical teenage thing. She stomped her foot. I don't even know why I asked. You never let me have any fun. You never let me go anywhere. And she stomped her way out of the room, expecting her friend to follow her, but she didn't. This wealthy friend stayed there. And after a couple of moments, she said, You know, Brother Raymond, I wish my parents would tell me no just once. It's hard raising children. It's hard helping them grow to be responsible adults. But moms and dads, we're the ones that brought them into this world. And we're responsible for growing them up. Trust those God-given instincts. Have the courage to stand up for what you believe. And the final lesson that we learn from the Bernals is turn your children over to God. Entrust your child into the hands of God. Brad and Misty Bernal refused to take a position of moral neutrality. They didn't opt out of moral and spiritual education and responsibility. They didn't say, well, you know, this was all forced on me. I had, I had faith crammed down my throat as a child, so I'm not going to take my children to church. I'm not going to take them to Sunday school. I'm just going to let them learn and grow on their own. And, and then when they're old enough to understand, they can make their own choices in matters of morality and in matters of faith. To a degree, I agree with that. Faith is not something we should cram down anybody's throat, especially not the throat of a child. But faith is something that we must lay on their hearts. God expects you to do that. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. 
And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In short, make God's ways known to your children. We all know that in recent decades, we've witnessed not just a decline, but an erosion, a retreat of moral and spiritual authority in the home. And that retreat has had disastrous consequences for the family and for our nation. Authority has been handed over to the peer group. Authority has been handed over to that uncaring, anonymous they out there. Will they say this? Will they do this? Too often, parents have remained neutral. For whatever reason, we hesitate or we just outrightly refuse to share with our children what's most important to us. And when Claudia and I were in college together, we had, we had the same majors. We both majored in history and in Greek, so we had a lot of classes together. One of the classes we shared was history of religion in America. And for that class, we had to write a paper on our own spiritual heritage, tracing it back as far as we could go. Claudia, two or three of her grandparents were orphans, so she only had to write about a four-page paper. I could trace both sides all the way to the Revolutionary War and beyond. And we didn't have Ancestry.com back then, so I had to drive around Texas and interview my great aunts and uncles. But it was a fabulous time for me. It was a 30-something page paper. I copied that paper just a few years ago. Two copies. Gave one to Bill and one to Hogan. I want my boys to know the role that faith has played in their family. Not just for their lives, but for generations and generations and generations. When I die and Bill and Hogan sit down with whoever the minister is to plan the funeral, And he asked them, tell me about when your dad became a Christian. How he came to faith in Jesus. Where was he baptized? I want them to be able to say, oh, that's easy. He's told us that so many times. I remember when Bill was just a tyke. He's about three years old, two years old. He loved watching sporting events on television with me. He loved going to the Ranger games. I took him when he was about eight months old to a a Mavericks game. And on the opening tip-off, the Mavericks tipped it to uh, Roy Tarpley, and he slam-dunked it, and everybody just went nuts. And Bill started to scream. He he, he didn't like all the noise, so we had to go out and watch the rest of the game in the foyer. I I tried to get him back into it, and he wouldn't do it. But, But somewhere after that, he really started loving to watch sporting events with me. And, of course, on television, so many of the of the ball games are sponsored by the beer companies. And so one day, when Bill was about three or three and a half, he said, Daddy, what is that? I said, that's called beer. It's what some adults drink. He said, do you drink beer, Daddy? I said, no, Bill, I don't. Why not, Daddy? And I didn't go into all the reasons, but basically I just said, well, first of all, I don't like the smell of it. So I know I don't like the taste of it. But, but really, more than that, I said, Bill, if you drink too much of it, it can make you have a car wreck while you're driving. So I don't drink beer. And, and that seemed to satisfy him. When we moved to DeRitter from Commerce, Texas, um, we found out that in our church there, there was a deacon named Mr. Wingate who was an expert on clocks. And we had this tall German, still have it, it's in the entryway of our house, German antique grandfather clock. And he offered, Mr. Wingate offered to anchor it to the wall of our house. And I thought that was a good idea. With two little boys running around, I could just see them bumping into that clock, it falling over, maybe falling on them. And so Mr. Wingate said he would do that. He, he came over to our house. It was in June, and it was just before Bill's fourth birthday. And Bill was just all over this project. He, he wanted to be Mr. Wingate's helper. So if Mr. Wingate was thirsty, Bill would run get him some water from the, from the kitchen. If he needed somebody to hold his screwdriver, his hammer, whatever, Bill was right there for him. And then Mr. Wingate said, you know what, Bill? There's a tool at my house that I forgot to get. I'm going to have to go back and get it. Would you like to ride in my truck with me? Mr. Wingate said, Bill studied him and said, Mr. Wingate, do you drink beer? (laughs) 
And Deacon Wingate kind of chuckled. He said, no, Bill, I don't. Bill said, I'll ride with you. (laughs) All I'm saying is we need to make God's ways known to our children. We need to let our children know who we are and, more importantly, whose we are. They need to know what we stand for, what we believe, what's important to us, and why. Teach them what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Not only according to the law, but according to God's law and God's word. I think it's interesting how different people can interpret an event in completely different ways. There have been many who have read Cassie's story and said, I wonder if her parents had been better off not introducing her to Christ, to the church, not turning her over to God. I wonder if they regret now Cassie's Christian faith. After all, if she had said, no, I don't believe in God, maybe they wouldn't have killed her. Two things. Klebold and Harris weren't really interested in hearing about Cassie's faith. They didn't give her time to answer why she believed in God. They weren't there for that. Jesus said, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's all he's about. Always and only. Second, it's very possible that Cassie had on her mind and heart in those last seconds of her life the words of Jesus. That whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall find it. If you're not ashamed of me before this evil generation, Jesus said, I will not be ashamed of you when I come in my Father's glory. And what about her parents? What about Brad and Misty? How how do they feel about their decision to take Cassie to church and to, to place her in God's hands? Did it mean that they didn't grieve her death? Of course they grieved her death. Did it mean their life would be changed forever? It was changed forever. Did they experience unspeakable anguish at her murder? Yes, they did. Of course they did. But do they regret having placed their child in God's hands? Absolutely not. In fact, now, more than ever before, they are confident that it was the right thing to do. In fact, they say it was the only thing to do. Moms and dads and grandparents, too. Time to light a candle of hope. Trust those God-given instincts. Trust them. If you're walking with God, He can speak through them to you about what's happening in the life of your children. Stand firm for what you believe. And entrust your child, your children, into God's hands. I don't think you'll ever be sorry that you did. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that in your word you remind us that not only do children have responsibilities to their parents, but parents also have maybe the greater responsibility to the children. Help those of us who have walked with you for a good while now be good mentors to the young ones, the children, those just getting started. Help us not only to tell them and teach them, but by our examples to show them what it is to be a responsible adult to be a Christian, to be a mature person in Christ. Father, we're sorry for the times when our example has not been what it should be. We ask your forgiveness. We ask forgiveness from our children. Help us all now live together 
in such a way that our homes are truly a haven of blessing and a place of peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me? We're going to sing a hymn of commitment just as I am. And as we sing, if God is moving in your heart to make decision public for Christ, this is the time to respond. Maybe it's to become a part of this church family. Maybe you've moved to Abilene, you're looking for a church home, and for some reason, God has led you to Pioneer Drive. There are so many good churches in our city, but maybe He's brought you here. And that God-given instinct this morning is leading you to be a part of this church family. Be obedient to the Holy Spirit. That's all I can say. Maybe God's calling you to place your life in His hands. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus, but you want to. We'd love to share. Right now, where you are, you can ask Jesus to come into your heart. Be your Lord and Savior and forgive you of your sin. He will change your life just as surely as He changed Cassie's that day. Maybe today you would come to say, I've been struggling with God, wrestling about a decision and and a call that He has on my life. And and I'm saying yes, but I need the church to stand with me. And, And would you do that? Of course we will. Whatever your need is, whatever your decision for Christ might be, I'll be here to receive you. More importantly, the Lord is waiting. You come as we sing together, just as I am.